time so that Matt has plenty of time for his very interesting talk. Um, Matt Hall here as a demographer. He specializes in immigration, segregation, housing, racial and ethnic inequality, and is an expert on spatial analysis. Um, he is new to he's new to Ithaca. I'm just making his acquaintance now, talking to him um, beforehand as we start the talk. This is his first talk at BCTR, but we hope there are going to be many more in the future and that he associates with, with BCTR over the next couple of years. And um, he's promised He's promised that this talk is so exciting the roof is going to come down, despite the, despite the extra columns. So, so I'll turn it over to Matt right now. All right, well, thank you for turning out today and for having me here. Um, ECTR actually has been very helpful in a lot of different ways in this project. Um, the, the small grant program helped compel Jake and I, my uh, co-author at UC Davis, to explore some of these issues on this kind of school di district demographics. There's always been this fundamental problem with work on school district School, the demography of school districts that I'll talk a little bit about today in that the data is just really hard to come by and it's really hard to aggregate and it's really hard to normalize. So if you want to do work on kind of longitudinal or temporal dynamics among school districts, then um, you need to think creatively. And so that got us to think creatively and it got us to kind of compelled us to, to work through some of these data issues and Jan um, helped us extensively with this and uh, BCDR funded um, uh, virtually all of the data acquisition, um, or the, the data assembly process, which took us, what, um, a year a year to do? Oh, just about a year. It took us a while. So anyway, so as uh, Elaine mentioned, I'm a demographer um, in a PAM in policy analysis and management. My research mostly focuses on kind of major social and demographic transformations and their impact on social inequality. Um, and on community kind of well-being and especially issues of inequality and issues of, of well-being that manifest in space, so residential inequality, neighborhood disadvantage, migration patterns, and how these are all interconnected with, uh, with the kind of the racial structure of, of, American, of American communities. So this talk is, or this area is relatively new to me, doing work on kind of schools and school districts, although I think the the focus is a little bit broader than this, but it's consistent with, with a lot of my other work on neighborhood migration and shifts to these new destination areas. So a little bit of background here. So I'm sure a lot of you are, are if you're not familiar with the numbers, you're, you've been paying attention to the world around you or to the news, and you know that the immigrant population has exploded over the last several decades. It's slowed down a touch recently, but it's still very high and much larger today than it was you know, a generation ago. So today we have about 40 million, see if this, get this. Um, oh. We have about 40 million uh, foreign born persons, and that, they, that makes up about, you know, let's say about one in eight um, Americans. If you combine that number, that group, with the total number of people that are children of immigrants, it's about one in four. So about a quarter of people in the United States today are either immigrants themselves or are, or are children of immigrants. So they've become an, an increasing, increasingly important uh, face of, the, of, of America. They have um, played an increasingly important role in discussions about politics, about our economy, and, um, and, and about social dynamics. So, it's no surprise that immigration on virtually every dimension has reshaped the face of American communities. That is, it's transformed social institutions, it's transformed political uh, discussions, it's transformed uh, uh, the, the uh, dynamics of job and housing competition, um, and really ultimately what it means to be an American, right? The, the, the identity, ethnic identity and, and um, our national identity has been, has been morphed and transformed by, by this growth. Now, at the same time as the immigrant population has exploded in numerical size, it's also pushed out geographically. So historically, the foreign born population has been concentrated in really just a handful of cities. So New York, LA, Chicago, 
Miami, Houston, were kind of the, the mainstays of the, uh, the settlement of foreign war populations for pretty much the whole part of the last century. That's, a, that's a, somewhat of an exaggeration, but it's, it's a largely true. So there's been this general process of diffusion or geographic dispersion away from these old kind of major gateways and into what we call, sometimes called new destinations or boom towns, um, or what I will call today just kind of non-traditional settlement areas. So you can look at this, you know, on a very broad level and nationally, and you can see that what I'm showing here, and I think there's a pointer on here, but I can't figure out how to do it. Um, well, you can generally see that, so the dark green bars refer to the share of the foreign born population that was that resided in California. So in 1980, 35% of all foreign-born persons as enumerated by the census resided in California. The next kind of light green are the, are the rest of the, the remainder of the big five, so Illinois, Florida, New York, and Texas. So you can see that, you know, uh, you know over two-thirds of the foreign-born population lived in one of those five states in 1980. And there's been this fairly dramatic shift away from that distribution by 2010. So you can still see that there's a, you know, still a very sizable share concentrated in California and in other states, but that blue portion has expanded hugely. And these, might, these, these shifts might not be what you think of as being radical shifts or radical changes, but you know, you're talking about either the movement of families across states or you're talking about um, a fundamental altering in the settlement behaviors of different populations. Okay, so you, it actually looks a little bit more dramatic when you start to look at individual cities or towns. Um, so Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, over the same time period, 1980 to 2010, and they all, the immigrant population in all these areas, in absolute terms, growed, enor it grew enormously, right? So in New York, it doubled, right? And, you know, it, between that time period, it, it added over two and a half million foreign-born persons, and those are very large numbers, and I don't want to dismiss those um, by any stretch of the imagination. But when you start to look at other smaller areas and areas that have kind of more recent histories of, of immigration, the relative pace of change, the growth rates of the former population are really quite alarming. So in Salt Lake City, it grew, it, you know, it, it grew by three, almost 350 percent, in Raleigh, 1500 percent, in Atlanta. 1,500% too, and if you look at some really small towns, you know, they're growing by factors of like 15, 16, 17, 18,000, right? They're really, really growing. And I'm not trying to pull a fast one on you. I know that you, you know, people under, here understand basic math, that if you have a small base and you grow up by even a, a modest number, right, so the growth rate is going to be relatively, or it's going to be exceedingly large. But my interest in this is, is not so much that What's happening? And I wish I had that pointer. <laughs> um, what's happening? There, what's happening in these areas is um, is is somehow more important than the growth that's happening in these major gateways. But in some ways, it's more kind of alarming. The the, the change that has occurred in these areas is more alarming if you if you consider for the fact if you consider that what's happening at the broad level and say. Atlanta, right, is often trickling down into all the sorts of areas that we actually have human interaction. So in the workplaces, in classrooms, in your kind of daily life, going to the grocery store, going to the child care center, right, the face of those populations that you're interacting with has changed in a very, very rapid way over, over you know, a sh relatively short period of time. So. Immigration has, and especially immigration that has uh, come from um, Asian and Latin American countries, has been fueling very rapid racial change. And I'll show you some pie charts here that break down that, the racial composition. But even in the absence of, uh, of immigration, we would still be diversifying very fastly. And that's because diversity is occurring from the ground up. What's really happening is not that immigration is radically altering the racial composition is it's that immigration kind of shocked the, the structure of our racial uh, of the racial order of our population and the differential fertility and mortality rates have produced a situation where even if we were you know magically able to build a fence 100 feet high and keep everybody out and shut down our immigration system we would still diversify simply by the fact of 
differential fertility rates. Okay, so diversity is, like the slide says, it's, it's occurring from the ground up. Dan Lecter has said, said that the seeds of diversity have already been sown. You know, that, that no matter what our immigration policy is, we're going to continue to diversify. And this is apparent if you look at diversity, if you compare levels of diversity or you compare the kind of racial composition um, among the adult and the child population. So this is what our racial, pop, racial composition in the U.S. looks like today. This is for the total population. You can see that it's about two thirds, it remains about two thirds white, you know, and kind of relatively equal slices that are Latino and black, although the Latino slice of the pie has grown. Um, and in different states, you know, this looks very differently. There are some states that have already reached that minority majority status, others that haven't. But among the child population, it looks quite different, right? So, you know, this is the under 10 population. That Latino pie is now a quarter. The white piece is almost under a majority. And if you actually look at, I looked at this this morning, if you look at the infant population, if you look at the kids that were born in 2012, right, it's now under a situation where we are no longer, the majority of babies born in 2012 are, are no longer white, right? So we're increasing, that, that pie is increasingly kind of standing out and um, becoming more, more and more diverse. And when you combine all of those processes, immigration and immigration from Latin America in particular, and differential fertility and differential mortality rates and differential age structures that produce those differential rates, and you combine that all with this dispersion process, right, where people are settling in dramatically different areas than they were settling 20 years ago. Um, it means that the change that's occurring, the racial change that's occurring, is much more pronounced outside those kind of major gateways than in those areas. And that's actually compounded by the fact that a lot of these non-traditional areas, right, you can think of rural communities, you can think of Ithaca, for example, although we haven't had this kind of influx of, of, um, of uh, Latino populations to the extent that other places have, but they are often racially homogenous or maybe have kind of binary racial structures. They're not, they, they don't have that kind of history of diversity that allows for rapid change. So this is kind of previewing some of the data that I'll talk about in a little bit. And this is, I know this is pretty, kind of hard to see, but these are all, all of these little units in this map are school districts, okay? And I've just kind of broken it out here down by, um, by the, the Hispanic share in school districts. So this is not the, the percent of kids in schools, it's just the percent of the population in the school district that the percent of the school age population that is Hispanic. And you can see the clustering that you would have ex that you expect along the, the border up through Southern California and then the spring you know sprinkling in parts of Florida and in and around New York City and then in kind of you know uh, uh, southeastern Washington, Idaho and and uh, Northeastern uh, Oregon. And then by 2010, it's changed quite a bit. Now, you may have actually anticipated more change. Um, and actually, when I created these maps, I thought, oh, I'm actually surprised that I actually would have expected to see kind of more green everywhere. But this tells you a few things. It tells you, one, that there is still a, there's still a lot of school districts, right, especially through the Great Plains, right, and through the Rust Belt that remain um, largely non-Hispanic. That doesn't mean that they're white, but that means that they're largely non-Hispanic. But it also is apparent, and just give me a second, if you, you know, kind of fix your eye on the southern Atlantic region or on kind of the Washington-Boston corridor or throughout parts of the Great Plains and especially through the Mountain West, and I'll kind of flip back, just kind of pick your favorite spot, and you can see that it's actually changed radically in some of these parts. So especially down here, you know, in Atlanta, South Carolina, North Carolina, it's actually changed a great deal. And these represent pretty substantial, um, very substantial shifts. I'll also show you when we, I dig into some of these kind of basic, very basic spatial dynamics, that this, the fact that there is still a lot of purple and green on these maps means that there's a lot of variation in even bordering districts, right? You can have districts that are largely Hispanic that are bordering districts that are totally white, right? And I think that is going to matter for um, these migration processes that, that I'm going to talk about. Question? Uh, my question was just uh, with that map, is that um, the percentage of the Latino population 
in that school district or of all school age children in the geographic area that corresponds to the school district? That's right, the second thing. It's all kids that are that live in the area that is encompassed by the school district. So it includes kids that are in the public schools, it includes kids that are in private schools and, and other sorts of arrangements. Okay. All right, so why does this all matter? Um, I, I mean, I think it matters for a lot of reasons, and there's been a huge amount of research that has been dedicated to, um, to understanding the impact of this racial change on social dynamics in new destinations, um, the impact on intergroup relations, the impact on economic competition, on economic development, on economic hardship, on political institutions, on religious institutions, on civic engagement. And there's been this basically this cottage industry of, of research on new destinations. And there's lots of scholars now, like myself, that try to contribute to that field of work on what happened, what are the, what's the impact of this dispersion process for these communities, what's the impact of these dispersions and these migrations for the mig immigrants themselves, what does it mean for the, the people who live there already, what has the response been, sometimes it's been very hostile, you can think about Hazleton, Pennsylvania, other times it's been very welcoming, right? And so there are all these different simultaneous moving parts that um, operate in these areas. And I think it makes for a really, really interesting way to understand kind of the future of, of integration, the future of the American color line, to understand how these processes are playing out in these new areas. It also means that, for the purposes of this project, um, that that kind of youthful diversity, right, where diversity is really embedded within the structure of our child populations, and as those kids grow, it's going to move like kind of a, like a, like a, a um, like a pig moving through a python, as demographers often say, you know, it's kind of going to move through that cohort. It's going to, um, it's going to uh, affect these outcomes and these these processes for a long period of time to come. It means that what's happening in the schools is um, is critical for understanding incorporation. And that's not to say that that race is only being contested within schools, but that that schools can be the sites of incorporation. And that's that, that happens through interactions between students, but that also happens with interactions between parents and students and teachers and students. It also matters because parents make decisions about where to locate based on the characteristics or context of the schools. And some people form their opinions or their attitudes about the role of schools and the need for schools based on what the schools look like and their perceived and their perceived contribution to um, their own life or, or, the, or the life that they imagine. So one kind of unfortunate um, empirical observation that we know from, from recent years is that while residential segregation, at least between blacks and whites, has kind of continued to decline and kind of remained stable for the other groups, that school segregation has increased. And part of this is, is due to this dispersion process, that the, the diversification of schools is actually connected to the segregation of, the, the diversification of areas is connected to the segregation or the resegregation of the schools that make up that area. And, oops. And so what does that mean? What are the mechanisms through which segregation occurs? Well, segregation can occur through a lot of different ways, but it's, it can occur through parents making decisions about where to send their child within a district, what school to send their child to. But it also, for the most part, is determined by mobility patterns, migration patterns, right? So parents might be able to open and enroll their child into a different school, or they might send their kid to a charter school or a private school. But for the most part, segregation is being maintained at both the residential levels and at the educational levels through differential patterns of mobility, right? Parents making decisions about where to locate within a district, or parents making decisions on a broader level of whether to move into a district entirely or out of a district um, as things change around them, right? So, so the point is that as Latino populations, and, or as these populations in general become more Latino or, or diversify, right, that may alter the migration decision-making process for parents about wh whether to move into a particular area or whether to or where to locate within a particular region. Oops. So we also know from a lot of work in political science and some work in sociology that 
racial context and racial diversity is associated with the way that people determine support for public goods and services. So there's um, several great papers um, in these fields in, in political science and also in economics that have shown pretty convincingly that ethnic heterogeneity or ethnic diversity is associated with reduced funding for kind of general public services, for roads, local services like sewage and, and trash, um, and schools, and enhanced public support for things like policing. Um, it's also related to lower support for welfare. And while the mechanisms for this connection are not crystal clear, you know, whether they're due to kind of um, homophilic social networks or whether they're due to some sort of racial hostility or racial animus, I think has not quite been teased out. But we do know that the racial context does have a consistently, um, racial diversity is a consistently negative association with support for public goods. And this occurs across um, municipalities in the U.S. It also occurs cross-nationally around the world. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty reasonably accepted uh, uh, empirical observation. Hey, can I ask a question about that? Mm -hmm. You cite some papers here in the 1990s, and those papers are 15 years old. And I can kind of imagine that that is a fluid. Not, not the things that, that were observed in, in, in the 90s not necessarily still hold up or yeah. it's something that's still being observed. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's uh, I think there's the possibility of that. The papers I'm citing here certainly do not cover, is not a comprehensive list of the papers that have explored these questions. These are um, papers that are, have been very um, noteworthy in the field, kind of move the field in a particular way. And so to some extent, these reflect kind of original or pioneer papers. And there's been a lot of research more recently that has demonstrated that, that these associations still exist. I'm, I'm not quite sure if they weakened over time. They may have um, as more places become more diverse. So you might also imagine that as the population ages, Right, that these associations might become even more amplified. Right, that these, these associations, both with how decisions are made about where to move and also how attitudes are formed about public goods, might be moderated by, by aging, by, by, by the age structure of the population and generally by, um, by processes of population aging. And so we know from some of this other work, and here's a more recent site for you, Jan, uh, although it's based on data from 1960. So. <laughs> um, that um, elderly, that elderly shares, right? The portion of the population that is elderly is located is located is linked to lower levels of educational spending, um, and that probably most importantly for this study is that support is lowest, and this has actually been a consistent finding, the support is lowest when you have this kind of generational and racial, racial mismatch, when you have old whites and the young population is non-white, right? That situation when there's this big generational rift and it's combined or compounded by with this racial, racial mismatch where, the, where, you know, anecdotally or speculative, you, you might think that the, the old people don't see these young kids as their own children, right? And they probably, they also aren't probably connected to them in their family histories, but um, they might, their, their different appearance and different uh, cultural and um, social characteristics might make them more visible in some ways. Okay, so um, this is just kind of showing why I think this, is a, this issue of aging is, is especially salient from a demographer's standpoint in that, you know, the Hispanic population, the Hispanic kind of school age population has been growing and is, projected to continue to grow, um, and you know, we can talk about you know, which projection I'm using here, but you know, they're, they're, the same pattern holds base, you know, no matter what the basic assumption is about these projections. Um, but at the same time as the Hispanic share is growing, the elderly share is growing. That is, the population is aging. So we're becoming more Latino and less white, and we're also getting older, right? And so these two things that are happening at the same time as this dispersion process is occurring, right, means that these issues, in my mind, actually become more salient rather than less salient as we, as we move forward. So those are kind of some of the big picture issues. Um, and for the purposes of, of this 
kind of more modest contribution, what we're really interested in is migration. And that shouldn't even really say out migration. It's just migration in general. That if all of these processes affect the ways that people make decisions about where to live, or affect the ways that people make determine their satisfaction with their community or with their residential area, right, then you might anticipate that Latino context or Latino growth or Latino change would be implicated in the mobility or migration behaviors of other populations. In this case, we're going to look at whites. So let me say a little bit more on that and then get moving on into some of the analysis. So there's um, a really large body of work, as most of you probably know, on white flight, and it's mostly focused on um, how uh, whites have avoided black neighborhoods historically, and especially as um, the black rate migration occurred in northern cities, how whites fled the suburbs. Uh, more recently, there's been work by Bill Fry, George Borjas, uh, Doug Gurak, and Mary Kritz, uh, each have contributed to this research as well, that has looked at the um, impact of immigration on the outmigration of particular native populations. There's some disagreement about, about which way that relationship goes, but Bill Fry and, and George Borjas have, have argued that there's this balkanization process through which uh, um, whites that are competing with with Latinos over jobs end up leaving the leaving labor markets altogether. And that has some implications for the way that we estimate the cost of the economic cost of of, of, um, of immigration. Um, some of my own work with Kyle Crowder has actually looked at neighborhood as is kind of more kind of embedded within this this kind of flight research and has looked at how racial compositions influence people's mobility into and out of neighborhoods. And we find pretty consistently that uh, if neighborhood immigrant shares and Latino shares are associated with white, actually, and black out migration, um, and this is especially true in these non-traditional areas. We actually don't even find that that, that process of migration away from uh, Latino populations um, defines mobility in these kind of traditional areas, but it but it has a kind of a modestized uh, association in some of these tradition non-traditional areas. Okay, so more broadly, the my point is that Latino context, Latino con context is plausibly linked to in and out um, migration decision-making behaviors, and that I think that the focus on school districts is interesting and important not just because it's different, right? People have looked at research on the neighborhood migration. They've looked at research on um, metropolitan or city migration or migration across states. But it's interesting because we have an area that is theoretically relevant, right? Because we know that people make decisions about where to where to live based on characteristics of the school, especially parents, um, and that it straddles this kind of local environment and the broader environment that you would you might anticipate both determine people's satisfaction and their and their, their residential decision making behaviors. Um, it also means that. And I'll talk more about this in a little bit. That the that the estimates that we produce are probably likely conservative in nature because we're, what we're not going to do is we're not going to pick up migration that occurs within school districts, right? So one way, if you want to avoid certain populations, one way to avoid that population is to leave altogether. Another way is to just change neighborhoods or change schools, right? And in some ways, that might be the more the the um, the kind of a stronger response, right? That people aren't going to are you know moving is a big deal, and so you might, and we know that people move relatively short distances. So moving out of a school district or avoiding a school district altogether is a particularly extreme response in our, in my mind. So I think that the estimates that we produce are are probably likely attenuated in some way. Um, but it's also important because I think the potential consequences are very substantial. That the consequences are substantial for that broader context for understanding racial dynamics in that broader context. They're also potentially important for schools themselves, right? If you have advantaged populations leaving school districts, right, that might have an influence on um, revenue streams, on uh, resources within schools, and not just financial resources, but uh, social capital and human capital resources within schools, parental involvement within these areas, right? That might all be connected to the out-migration or, or differential in-migration of particular populations. Okay, so I'm supposed to finish up everything I have in 10 minutes. So, um, I'll see if I can do that. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to explore how Latino student growth is relate, relates to white migration behaviors. And what we're doing here is, is very descriptive, 
um, you know, just some economists in the room, or um, uh, you know, so I have to be sure to put this caveat up. Um, it's a kind of a demographic accounting model what we're going to do, and so we're not going to produce causal estimates of the impact of Latino migration on or Latino growth on migration. We're going to look at um, kind of general patterns of how Latino flows are related to, to um, white flows. We're taking a long-term view, so we're not looking at a particular school district or a particular, or, or excuse me, a particular time point in time. We're actually looking at the period over the last several decades, and we're being geographically inclusive. So we're not looking at a particular school district. We're looking at virtually all school districts in the U.S. So specifically, we're going to ask, and I'm going to try to get through this. Um, is Latino student growth associated, I should say associated, with white population change between 1980 and 2010? Does this association differ by the age of white residents? Um, are the observed associations that we find similar in traditional and non-traditional areas? And then how does the broader spatial context influence these, these potential um, uh, associations? Okay, so data. So the big problem, and this is where the BCTR has been so important for us is that obtaining data on school districts is really hard to do. It's actually, you can't, it's not, you just can't go into Social Explorer and just download, you know, the summary tables for school districts. You can do that for 2010, and I think 2000. But when you start getting back in time, it gets much, much harder to do that. And Jan was actually knee deep in some of the, the, the raw summary file tables trying to link school districts with their um, or link track data in the school districts, and we we're trying to kind of reconstruct school school districts based on uh, um, original maps in New York, for example. Um, I won't bore you with all of those details, other than saying that it was a pretty substantial undertaking to create this longitudinal file. The lack of data is compounded again by the fact that you have all these institutional and, and administrative changes. Right, you have school districts change over time. Right, they split, they consolidate, they change names, they, um, they annex territory, you know. And so we have to figure out a way to deal with all those things. And so here is, this is probably a little bit hard to see, but this is in, so here's Watkins Glen School District. And this B here shows you, I can't remember, it's Campbell, Savona, if I'm saying that right. This is a district that between 1990 and 2000 was consolidated. So Campbell and Savona were two different districts, they consolidated. And so when you look at the data in isolation, right, these look like three different school districts, right? You have one, two, and then the combined one over time. And so you have to figure out a way to normalize those over time. So we have a list, we've constructed a list, in, well, we were provided with a list by Sean Corin on all these institutional changes since 2000, and then we, um, um, and then we updated that list um, for, the, for the 2000s period. And so, you know, these are all the different types of changes that can occur. You can have name changes, which result in kind of what we call fixed codes changes, changes in the codes that identify districts, consolidations, mergers, disillusions, splits, right? And again, I could bore you with all this stuff, but um, the first three are relatively easy to take care of. Well, they're not, I don't, they're not, maybe not easy, but they can be dealt with, right? So we can reconstruct districts that become larger as the years progress by kind of reconstructing what they looked like in 2010, um, in 1970. And we played around with a lot of these things. Um, but districts that become smaller, that is districts that split, it's, it's pretty much impossible to deal with these. So we end up throwing away um, these districts that either dissolve or split. The reality is, is that the, the movement is all towards consolidation. There's very few splits that occur. Um, and there's very few disillusions, right? So, so these can be things like uh, elementary, um, it, so an elementary and a high school district becoming a consolidated district would be that consolidation. It's really uncommon for a unified district to split into an elementary and high school district or for some larger district to split into, into two um, smaller districts. So I think that if there is a source of bias, it's the magnitude of it is working in our direction here. At least that's what I tell myself. Okay, so we're restricting the sample to unified and elementary districts, so this is just because um, there's unified elementary and high school districts. They, for the most part, high school districts intersect with elementary districts, so we have to, and so because we don't want to count them twice, we have to throw one of them out. We throw out high school districts, which is pretty common in the, in the research. Um, we make some size restrictions, 
and then we come that we, we end up with you know uh, about you know a little over uh, 12,000 districts, and that we that by our estimates cover about 94% of all students. The, the coverage rates vary a little bit, but they're they're always you know up there close to 90. Okay, so the main outcome we're going to look at white population change. Um, I'm going to do this for um, kind of broad age groups. And then for the 2000s, I'm going to break this down by specific age groups. So one of the big limitations is getting the data is hard, but even the amount of data that you can obtain is, is very limited. So we're actually, we can't look at, say, you know, white people with children. We can't look at particular types of households, you know, whether they're poor or non-poor. We're really limited in the kind of characteristics that we can look at. If you're familiar with census data, you're basically limited to summary file one information, um, short form information. So we're going to break this for the more recent period. We can break this down by specific age groups, um, and the more recent period, we're actually able to use some demographic techniques to actually convert that population change between two periods into the total number of net migrants. And what we do by that is we have data on um, county deaths for every year between that period, and we can calculate the age and race specific death rates. We can apply those, making the assumption that the that the ASDRs at the county level reflect those at the school districts, and we can net out the number of estimated deaths from, from each of these counts. So what, what we'll be left with in the 2000s are the total number of net migrants. Net migrants is just the difference between the in and out migrants. I'll talk more about this in a minute. Um, so the, our, you know, our main kind of independent variable, our focal predictor is the change in the school age population. And this is, this is not kids that are in the public schools, it's kids that are in the residential area of the school district. So they can be in public schools and private schools, they can be in, not in schools at all. But, um, but, but this is the best we can do. Um, um, I do break this down a little bit later on, I, I kind of split this into elementary and secondary age groups. I also look at other um, racial groups that I can show you if we have time. Um, we look at traditional and non-traditional settlement areas. This is kind of a standard approach um, that is taken. We've tried lots of different ways to do this. Um, we're going to um, guard against the possibility that that what's happening in these school districts is not so much that the racial composition is changing, changing, but the socioeconomic kind of mix of the neighborhood is changing. And you know, we can what we can do the best that we can. We have changes in poverty rates, changes in housing characteristics. We have a few other variables, but they're all pretty highly correlated with these things. Um, and then we have a number of kind of basic statistical controls. So we're going to do this all again for you economists. It's largely descriptive. Um, we do kind of try to offset the endogeneity of uh, white population change to Latino population change. That is, that maybe Latinos are moving into areas where white populations have been leaving. We guard against that possibility by by netting out the pre-trend in white population. So we look at basically what we do is we'll, we'll estimate deviations from the secular trend in white population change over time, and that's what we'll get. So we're, we're hoping kind of broadly to be able to interpret our, our results in that, in that way. We do that with this, uncon this unconditional quantile model because we have a distribution of you know, white population change that is very highly skewed. Um, it's also very leptocritic. And so we use uh, an unconditional model. I won't bore you with the details here, but it can basically, we basically just transform our dependent variable and run it through an OLS and bootstrap the standard errors. Okay, so here's some results. Okay, so these are, what I'm showing you here are the full models. They're gonna include everything, including that white pre-trend. That's the, the age-specific tree pre-trend, all of the, um, the socioeconomic characteristics, and all the controls. I'm just I'm trying to simplify this, just to focus on what I think is important here. And so this is in 1980s. This is the association between Latino kids in the previous decade, that is between 1970 and 1980, and white population change between 1980 and 1990, netting out the pretrend in, in white population change. And so what this suggests is that these are pretty big effects, actually, um, in, the, in the 80s. Mm -hmm. That uh, one 100 Latino school-age children is associated with a reduction in the white population of about 14 persons, okay? And the, for the older population, the, the association is weaker, um, but that also reflects differences in the size of these two groups. Um, and then you, we did the same thing for the 90s and the 2000s, and you can see that the associations are all statistically significant and negative, um, but they did, there is some 
kind of tentative evidence that the that the association has waned over time, right? That that if you you know I don't want to you don't necessarily want to think about these in terms of like flight, but if there is if that's helpful to think about it in that way, you can think that that association between Latino migration and um, white out migration and um, cautiously interpreted has diminished over time, but is still negative and significant. So this, you know, is the, the, the effect size here is like 100 Latino kids associated with the loss of 3.4 white persons um, of that age group. Okay, so, so here we're gonna do it for the 2000s. We're gonna break it down by these specific age groups and we're gonna look at, um, these are net migrants, right? So we're taking out the deaths. We're able to take out the deaths to guard against this possibility that maybe Latinos are moving into areas that have very high death, you know, very high white mortality rates. That's really not true, but but we can we can get more precise estimates here. Okay, so I'm just showing you the significant associations here. So these associations during the 2000s and for these more specific groups are kind of um, they seem to me more plausible in um, or they seem plausible in in size. So 100 Latino kids is associated with the reduction in the net, in net migration of about one person um, between 30 and 39, similar for the 40 to 40, 49 group, and then it kind of drops off beyond that. Um, and we actually do estimate it for the 80 to 80 plus group, and it's not significant. We break this down by kind of destination type, and I know I'm kind of screaming through these, but um, I want to have some time for questions. And what, what you see is that just like in some of the work that I've done on neighborhood mobility, that the, the associations are driven almost entirely by what's happening in these non-traditional areas, right? That in the more traditional areas, there are kind of some, at least there's one group, there's this, you know, pretty small but significant association, um, but that's dwarfed by what's happening in the, the non-traditional destinations, right? So these are, like I said before, you know, at the median, at least, of the distribution about 100 Latino kids associated with the reduction in the white net migration counts of 4.6 uh, white persons between 30 and 39. Okay, so the last part of our analysis tries to look at these spatial dynamics a little bit. So here's again that map in, the two, in 2010 of Latino population shares in every school district. Excuse me. And what you'll see is you'll see a lot of places that are really green and a lot of places that are really purple that are surrounded by a lot of green or surrounded by a lot of purple. And so my argument is that I think that these, the kind of location of a district within kind of the constellation of other districts might matter for the way that people make these migration decisions. So if you go down to El Paso, and this is really hard to see, you can't see these numbers, but these numbers are all really big, so El Paso's right right over here somewhere. But these numbers are like 80, 82, 94, 94, 53, this is 30, 39. They're all really big. Like the Hispanic share in in West Texas and in New Mexico and in parts of Arizona, right, they're all really large. And that's a different context, right? If you want to flee from Hispanics in this area or if you're moving into El Paso, right, you don't have a lot of options, right? You don't have a lot of places to... Uh, of a lot of other alternatives to go to. But in North Carolina, so this is, this right here, Lexington, North, North Carolina is that little school <coughs> district right there. It's a, it's a small city that has, that does um, carpet making, textiles, and they also call it the barbecue capital of the world. So they, they have, you know, the kind of the, the three tiers of, that prop up undocumented migration, right? Textiles, carpet making, and pig farming, right? And so that little district right there it's not the whole district, but the city district is about a quarter Latino. The district that is it's embedded within is, I think it's, I think it's five five point seven percent Latino. So you can think of it maybe in the city suburb context, and this is a more rural area. But there are these big kind of dichotomies between some of these between some of these areas. And you and if you look around the map, you know you can see lots of little islands of green that are you know they kind of surrounded by seas of purple you know, all over. So what we do is we'll t we take the we take the we see how that condition those spatial associations moderate the relationship between Latino change 
and whiten that migration. And what we do is, um, it's a little bit technical, but we, we create these spatial weight matrices that are based on contiguity. And we basically just calculate the average percent Latino, the weighted average of a percent Latino in all the neighboring school districts. There's a lots of different ways to do this, but this is kind of the simplest approach. And what you see is that that interaction term moderates that in a positive way. So what this means graphically is that it's just like I um, hypothesized, and that in districts where the Latino population is growing, but you're surrounded by lots of non-Hispanic districts, that association is fairly steep, right? But in districts where the alternatives, right, the places that you likely might see as, as potential alternatives are 40% are Hispanic, right, that the slope is, is much less steep, right? So there's, there's less of a uh, response or, um, or arguably whites are less sensitive to the local Latino mm -hmm. context when kind of the set of alternatives maybe isn't all that much better if that's their, this is the simple version of telling that story. Okay, so wrap up really quick. So um, what do we find? We find that whites' migration beha behaviors appear to be sensitive to changes in the Latino populations. Here's some of the, the size of the associations. There's some evidence that it's weakened over time. Um, we find that it's most pronounced in these non-traditional areas. Um, you know, whether this is due to, I can talk more about this little in Q&A or later, um, whether it's due to kind of selection processes, that is people in um, kind of new destination or in a traditional areas who don't want to be around diverse populations just simply already having left, right? That's a different story than one of accommodation that people get used to having um, um, uh, diverse faces around. Um, we also find that it, it appears to be middle-aged whites that are most sensitive to um, Latino populations. Um, it's not uh, the elderly that um, some had initially hypothesized and that we had actually thought we would find more of. Um, and that this broader spatial context moderates that relationship, this, that the spatial context matters. So I have a few other things um, that I can go through, but um, I think it's probably a good time to stop here and, and get your reactions and, um, and take some questions. So. Thanks. <laughs> um, I actually have, well, I guess one question about the findings with regards to the middle aged group being mm -hmm. the most likely to move um, compared to, well, more likely to move in the older group. Right. Um, so, do you think part of that is because of the relative mobility rates um, by age, mm -hmm. and then also possibly um, whether they have children? I think it's both of those. And um, your first point is a good one. Um, and there's probably something we can do empirically to, to, to explore this kind of differential baseline mobility patterns. That's a good point, because there is a pretty steep age curve to mobility. Um, well, one thing with that, too, would be, I don't, I don't know enough about, like, I, I need to read up more on like, where people settle based on their age, but if you looked at um, like traditional more retirement Community areas and compared. I don't know if that would help. Like, it would be interesting to know what the difference between like looking at Florida or something versus yeah. an area that is traditionally not as that doesn't have as high of a proportion of retirement right. communities. Like, just to see what the difference would be. Yep. Yep. I can look a little more into that. Um, your point about these children, these families having children, yeah. I think, is really good. And I think that's, you know, my hunch on, on into what's happening here is not so much that families are leaving these districts, but that it's, a, it's so it's not, and it makes it a little tricky to interpret these, these associations. I don't think it's so much that families are leaving districts that have growing Latino populations. I think it's more likely that new immigrants are avoiding districts that have growing um, Latino populations. So, you know, if you imagine Ithaca, right, it's a, it's a big deal to change if you're a family, you have kids and young, young kids in schools, to move in general. It's a really big deal to change districts. Um, if you're just moving into this area and you don't like the context of, you don't want your kids to go to the hippie Ithaca high school, right? And so you might make the decision early on that you want to be in Lansing or something, right? So I think those, those, those snap judgments and also that process is, um, that those, the, the sensitivity of those kind of, of the demographic context is, is especially salient they're in the immigration process, especially among people that don't know a whole lot about the area. Yeah. 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 Y
And that for these measures were net migration. Net migration, right. right. So, so that's that's the thing that in the last slide, you know, we don't we aren't able to compare in versus out migrants with the nature of our data. You would need another sort of um, um, you, you need different uh, sources of data in order to, to look at those patterns. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Well, you may also, you may just have this in your data, but another way of looking at whether or not it's, yeah, it's, it's the your data set mm -hmm. would be to look at what, whether the effect is constant for people in the same age groups with kids who, with, with kids who are actually in the public schools, which is not. Right? Like, because these are, this is everyone living in the district. Mm -hmm. You mean, so you mean to look at? Compare kids who are being, private schools of some sort, and therefore you're controlling your kid's actual school environment. Right. So you may not care about your, your sort of immediate environment outside the school. You may be just trying to make yep. sure that you have the control. Yep, that's a really good point. And we've, we are actively working on that um, because I think, you know, I mentioned earlier on that I think these are attenuated hugely by what's happening internally within districts, whether it's just changing schools or changing or sending your kid to a charter school or a private school. Um, it's tough um, to do that in a pretty comprehensive way, but we're but we're, we're working on that. Yeah. yeah, you can get more recently. They have pretty pretty rich uh, detail on on uh, demographics of individual schools and also the number of charter schools, the number of private schools, and the enrollment in those schools in the racial context. You can't go back to 1970, but you can do it for the 2000s. Yeah. Yep. Similar to the. Um, do you know? If how does the sequence of the curve vary with, uh, or maybe, I don't know whether you can have this data, uh, with the age of the, uh, of the parent, parent and school for the children, uh, is, it, is it steeper or less steep with uh, parent, generally parents who have high school age children versus uh, elementary? I think that also gets into the part of the uh, school choice thing because you do yeah. have less choices. Yeah, I know why I'd love to be able to answer that question, and, and we can. For some of the more recent years, and, and we probably want to look into this more closely, that we can do some of that. We can look, we can break down, say, the white population change due to that that is driven by, um, or we can break, break down change between families and non-families and parents' children and parents' non-children. Um, and I think we can even look at the age of the child. But with this long-term view, we're really limited just to age, you know, and once you get into starting to kind of um, deal with these small cells, then you have issues of suppression and, and other um, kind of data limitations. Other questions? Just, just yeah. so I'm clear, and I'm a little slow on this now. Um, your population, sorry, is it the census population of mm -hmm. 5 to 5 to 19 year old kids in the mm -hmm. district? And yet we know pretty easily the the, the school the specific district population. Well, for more recent years, you do. When you're talking about going back to 1970 or 1980, and you're talking about reconstructing these districts based on other census data, you don't necessarily. Um, you know, I don't know this. I don't know the literature all that well. But my hunch is that, especially in these, in these non-traditional areas, there aren't a huge number of kids that are going to non-public schools. Um, a lot of these a lot of these districts, especially the smaller ones, only have a couple schools in the district, um, and so I think it's a hugely important consideration that there are these internal dynamics. But um, and in some ways, you might anticipate that because those internal dynamics are so profound that you wouldn't even you wouldn't expect parents to be leaving districts, or I shouldn't say that you wouldn't expect migration behaviors to be, kind of broader migration behaviors to be sensitive to the broader school district context, but we, you know, our, our findings suggest that, that they are at least partially, so. Yep. Can you could see the economy effect, I mean, for example, 1970, and now 2000, the economic state is different. Mm -hmm. So in the whole world, in the USA, and in different states, I think this may go back to the result. So you need to use this as a covariate. Completely. Use what as a covariate? The economic state. Yeah. Yeah, and so again, that's we're kind of limited there. We have, you know, we've we tried to do that with, we have poverty rates in here that is going to be in some way linked to the economic well being of the, of the areas. Um, 
it doesn't at all fully capture the economic context or the economic diversity or the industrial structure of some of these communities. Um, we've explored a few other characteristics. We have estimated models with unemployment rates, with um, household income change. They all produce really similar estimates. It's just, just that those, those three things, change in poverty, change in income, and change in unemployment are all really tightly correlated. So they, they become kind of less meaningful on their own, but they don't alter the focal relationship. Those non-traditional um, districts, is there any way to control for size of districts? Because like, when I was look, looking at the, the map that before, it's astounding how different they are. Like some of the districts in the bottom look like the size of the state of Rhode Island. Yeah. So we, don't, so we control for the total population, and we control for population density of the district. Um, we haven't considered like the physical size. Um, and yeah, no, I think you're right. I think that could matter a lot just based on what we know about how people move, right? People move relatively short distances. So in districts, you know, up in, in New York, for example, right, mm -hmm. or in Illinois, where there's just a godly en number of school districts, right, you might anticipate that there's um, more mobility than in, like, Florida, where school districts are, are bounded by counties. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that's a good point. I can, I can uh, look into that. Just thinking about an early question about the middle-aged population, I was wondering if, if there's a relation with uh, rental or housing units that are being rented and owned. Does that kind of corresponds with, with an age group that moved from rental units to to yep. own, owning a home? And yeah. 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 That's a good point. I can look into that. Um, so I think we do have that information. I mean, an anecdotally, we know that that's often kind of an important factor when you ask people in these areas, you know, why are you opposed to immigration? And they say, oh, they come in here and they live, you know, 10 people per room and they don't take care of their lawn and they don't, they're not just not good neighbors. So these issues of kind of commitment and, and, and permanency and that, are, that are embedded within the home homeownership process are, are salient, I think. There's a on the, I mean, for different levels of Latino population density, how the white people react to the evacuation? So, is there a certain tolerance level that is likely to migrate on? So, like, like non linearities in this, yeah. Um, we've explored it a little bit. We haven't, we actually, we've actually considered, explored it quite a bit. We haven't found real strong evidence that there are. Nonlinearities. I mean, theoretically, you would you would think that there are threshold effects or kind of steep, uh, you know, curvilinear relationships between these. Um, it's a little tricky to do in this in this um, quantile approach um, to get the, to back out the marginal effect from that. But um, but but we have looked at it. Yeah, we don't, there's not. Uh, I guess the point is that there's not real strong evidence that. It, Empirically, that that there is, but I think theoretically, you would you would expect that. Yeah. Is there any difference between um, different demographics of Latino population? So, for example, the difference between uh, with Florida, you have large Cuban population, which is a different yeah. heritage, Asian different culture. I would love to do that. Um, I think that's yeah. I mean, I think the response to Jamaicans is very different than the response to um, Salvadorans. Um, I mean that. Most of these places, it's almost entirely being driven by Mexican and Southern American migration mm -hmm. outside of a couple states, outside of Florida and parts of Georgia, and parts of New York, I guess parts of Texas too, but it's mostly all Mexican, or if it's not all Mexican, the people that live there think it's all Mexican, um, and they think it's all illegal Mexican, you know, so, um, but yeah, no, I would love to, to further disaggregate the the, the national origin groups, but we just we really don't have the data on, on those sorts of things. Anything else? I think we're already over time, so I won't hold you any longer. Thanks for having me. And